Well, about every five years, I preach this message. I'm preaching it partly because I'm in the mood to preach it. I'm preaching it for another reason. It's a reminder to us of the ministry that we have and what this ministry is really all about. I trust it'll be a blessing to your heart. It's long, but be encouraged because each there are eight points, but each point only has two verses, and I really have anything particular than those verses to comment on. We, uh, we think of God's greatness, and you know that uh, even that bulletin with that eagle on the front of it reminds us it's not a buzzard, it's, uh, it's looking up an eagle, the, the very emblem of our country. By the way, it was uh, uh, Benjamin Franklin wanted the turkey. He wanted us to have the turkey for our national bird. <laughs> Do that at Thanksgiving, man. We have the eagle. And it pictures greatness. It's, it's our emblem of the bird for this country is that great bird. We have a great God. And the verse that I want to preach on, just one verse, just one verse with eight points is all about our great God. Take your Bibles and turn to John chapter 3 and verse number 16. I'm going to give you the outline, so you just use one. In it. You could probably start at the very top and go every other line. And here's the uh, outline. For God, the greatest being, just don't, you can write the word with it if you want, so loved the greatest emotion, the world, the greatest need, that he gave the greatest gift. <laughs> I like that. That he gave the greatest gift. His only begotten son. The greatest sacrifice. That whosoever believeth in him. The greatest invitation. Should not perish. The greatest deliverance. But have everlasting life. The greatest promise. What a tremendous verse. This verse is all about the greatness of God and the things that he did. Did you know before the world was ever formed, God already had the plan for Jesus to come and suffer on Calvary to provide eternal life. It couldn't happen short of Christ dying for us. I, I have a theological explanation for that, but I'm not going to put it in here today. Uh, sometime soon I'll show you that. We can measure it with different things. God's a great God. There's no one like our God. God has four primary attributes. We pronounce them a little different, but they mean this. He is omnipotent, omnipotent. He's all-powerful. He's omniscient. Omnipresent is the niscience, uh, omniscient. Uh, pardon me, uh, science. He's all-knowing. Omniscience is all-knowing. He's omnipresent. That one pretty much explains itself. He's everywhere all at once. The last one doesn't get an omni. The last one is he's immutable. You should have these four written down somewhere and part of your memory. Somebody ask you about God. Say God is four things to us. And they all picture his greatness. God had this plan for his son to come and provide us with eternal life. Father, I love this text. I love this message. It's, it's terse. It's very direct and to the point. It's very clear in teaching what I want to teach on today. God bless this 25-word verse to our heart's need. And we'll thank thee and give thee praise. In Jesus' name, amen. 25 words, 12 on one side picture in the Old Testament, 12 on the other side picture in the New Testament. Guess what the center word is? Son. <laughs> the Son of God is in the middle. Well, here it is. For God, the greatest being. Right down there, Malachi 3 6. You can look at it if you want. I'll just quote it for you. I, I am the Lord. I change not. Therefore, you sons of Jacob are not consumed. What a picture of a powerful God. For God, the greatest being. God has the power. 
with the, with the word of his mouth, with the snap of his finger, to bring about anything and everything that he would want us to see and to know. It's found in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and number 4. Let me get it here real quick. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6. In the Jewish uh, language and in the Jewish religion, they observe this as the great Shema. They stand together and quote these words in verse number 4. Hear, O Israel... The Lord our God is one Lord. You know what's interesting about that? Dedicated Jews quote this scripture. Lord is singular and God is plural. Elohim is plural. Hear, O Israel, Jesus our Father is one Jesus, is one Lord. Isn't that amazing? And then verse 5 goes with it. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy might, and uh, let's see, I left one off here. With all thy soul and with all thy might. What a great God we have and the things that he does. A number of times in the Old Testament, he looked at Moses. He said, Moses said, well, who shall I tell him sent me? God said to Moses, tell him the I am sent you. Tell him I am that I am. When Jesus came in physical form, God in the flesh, in the book of John, seven times he said, I am. And each one of those pictures, some part of the work that Christ did. Seven's always the number of completion. I am the bread of life. I'm not going to go through all of them, but bread is sustenance. He supplies eternal life for us. That's God. We have a great God. So many of these religions have multiple gods. Can you imagine such a thing? God shares his being with no one. There is none else beside God. Before Abraham I, uh, was, I am, Jesus said. Now, bear in mind, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We don't have three gods. That's one God manifesting himself in those three ways. You're a tripartite person. You know that. You're one sitting there, but you're body, soul, and spirit. And when I talk to you, I'm talking to those three parts of you. They each supply an expression of who and what you are. That's our God. The greatness of God. The greatest being before anything was. God was already here. Notice the second part of the verse. For God so loved the greatest emotion. Uh, isn't that a good thought? The greatest feeling that God could put forth. Uh, let's see how many there are. Uh, there are 17 emotions. You can think of most of them. I didn't bother to write them down. But there are seven things, like you can be anger and you can express love. You can express envy. There are 17 different emotions. But God primarily is love. God knows what it is to hate sin. And God will not look on sin and God will not regard sin. But the number one is love. In 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 13, he said, uh, now abideth faith, hope, and love. Agape. That's God love. But the greatest of these is love. And I want you to know today, my friend, God is love. You know where that's most found concerning God? Most scriptures are concerning us. Is in First John chapter 4. The whole chapter is about the love of God. And in chapter 4, at uh, verse number 7, we read, Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God. Here it is, for God is love. His very prime attribute beyond the four that I gave you. The first one is love. God loves you today. God loves your friends. You have an unsaved friend that for personal reasons, maybe family, maybe blood relation, it's someone you love. God loves him more than you do. And God wants you to share the gospel of his love with them. Isaiah 48, verse 12. Isaiah 48 and verse number 12. Let me read this real quick. In fact, we'll go down a few verses with it. 48 verses uh, 12 through 14. Uh, Hearken unto me, O Jacob, Israel, my called. I am he. I am the first and I am the last. Mine hand also hath laid the foundation of the earth. 
and my right hand to span the heavens. When I call unto them, they stand up together. All ye assemble yourselves and hear, which among them hath declared, which among them has declared these things. The Lord hath loved him. He will do his pleasure. And here he mentions Babylon. His arm shall be on the Chaldeans. I, even I, have spoken, God said. I love you. The worst of sinners, if he would but look, if you hear today and you hear this message and you do not go know God, if you would but look, God's hand is out to you and open, and he's saying, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Don't count on that for a long time. There'll be a day when you stand before God, he'll have an outstretched arm and a clenched fist, and he will pour out the winepress of his wrath upon mankind. In that tribulation period, the Jews get it first because of their rebellion, and then he turns it to the Gentile. Thousands upon thousands of people die because of the wrath of God. But right now, he's the God of the outstretched arm and the open hand because he loves you. He loves me. He wants us to have a good relationship with him. For God so loved the world, the greatest need. Stop and think about it. 7.7 billion people. If this COVID-19 thing were in fact a pandemic, the death toll would be have to be in a large percentage, say like 10 to 1. 7.7 billion people, 770 million, uh, that'd be one-tenth, would die. And what are we looking at? The total figures under 100 million. Well, be that as it may, all you, what you're guaranteed, friend, is that you who are in the world, we who are in the world, we were born here and we will die here. I've stood over open grave doing a, a funeral and having gotten a piece of the dirt out before, I'll have it in my hand and stand next to the casket and say, from dust thou art and to dust thou shalt return. That's the best you can expect out of your life. You started out with about 17 elements that made up the dirt that's in you. All the rest of you is water. <laughs> can you imagine that? When you die, what's left turns back to dust. From dust thou art to dust thou hast returned. But that's only one third, friend. The soul and the spirit stands before God. If you're saved, you get a new body. Isn't that precious? Wait, by the way, when you die and you're a Christian and the Lord hasn't come yet, you get First Corinthians, Second Corinthians 5, you get a temporary house that you live in until the resurrection. Then at the resurrection, the dead rise first. And if you were in that group, you're united back where your body died and you're given your new body and you're carried up to meet the Lord in the air. Ah, but those of us who are still here and haven't died yet, yeah, even at my age, I'm still looking for the rapture, looking for the upper taker, not the undertaker. Uh, we get changed. In the moment, the Bible says, in the twinkling of an eye, we'll be made over new in the likeness of Christ, not image as far as twin, but made like our Savior is, and we're taken up into the presence of the Lord. The world, that's what God loves. Matthew 18, 7, I kind of forgot my verses here, I'd be a little careful. Uh, Matthew 18, 7 says, Woe unto the world because of offenses, that's sin. For it must needs be that offenses come, but woe to that man by whom the sin comes, the offense comes. But God sent Jesus into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. But God looks on man. How bad can it get? Genesis chapter 6 and verse number 5. Satan had so corrupted mankind to see to it that they could not approach God, that God sent an angel to look. In fact, God himself looked and said, God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thought of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented God in his heart that he had made man upon the earth. He said, I will destroy man from off the earth from whence he has come. That's it, Genesis 6, 5 through 7. Verse 8 says, 
but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. The God who loves us, the greatest being in all the world, wants us to be eternally saved, and that love is passed on to one man, and from that with his family came all of us that are alive today as they came off that ark. Uh, uh, Noah and his wife, and his children and their wives, and all the population today comes from that. Can you imagine such a thing? That's what God loves. Isaiah 13 and verse 11. I'll just use one more verse here. Isaiah 13 and verse number 11 says this. And I will punish the world for their evil and the wicked for their iniquity. And I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. You have to read on to find where he does something to offset that. But that's God's view of the world. I'll quote this from Mark 8, 36 and 37. What would it profit a man if he gained the whole world and lost his own soul? Or what would a man give in exchange for his soul? You want to know the truth of this. God sent Jesus to die for 7,700,000 people that are alive today. And that's going up at quite a rate, I might add. And that same group that have all died since the beginning of time, Christ died for them as well. The world are made up of people that are made in God's image. But man without God is lost. He cannot approach the Lord. God, being of pure eye, cannot look on sin, will not regard iniquity. Well, for God so loved the world, now watch this one, that he gave the greatest gift. Romans 6.23, if you know the Romans road, you're winning someone to Christ. When you get to 6.23, they've already admitted they're a sinner. They've already seen God and all his righteousness. And you've showed them from the scripture by going back to chapter 5 that Jesus reconciled them through his shed blood so that they could be saved. And now 623 has these two words. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Here we have the greatest gift, and God gave it to us. Let's look at those two words real quick. What are wages? There's something you work for. You put in 40 hours, you walk up to your boss, he can't say, well, maybe I'll pay you. He owes you. That's what wages are. Somebody's paying you for what you deserve. And by the way, the wages of sin is death. You're a sinner and you've never received the payment for sin, which is Jesus Christ our Lord. You're going to pay that debt. You want to see it? Just turn over to Revelation chapter 20. Start at verse 11. You'll see the dead, small and great, stand before God and the books will be open. Plural. And every man will be judged out of the books except for those who are found written in the Lamb's book of life is mentioned there. And only those in the Lamb's book of life were set aside. It said of all those judged according to their works. Listen, if you're lost, you actually think you're going to stand before God and God's going to judge your good and your bad and you'll take your chances. No, you won't. You don't have a chance. The wages of sin is death and you die twice. The first is physical. Not necessarily getting old, somewhere in there, an accident or illness or whatever, you will die. And after that, the judgment, which is called the second death. Here it is in its finality in Revelation 20 and verse 11. Jesus mentioned it when he said to those who came and presented their goodness, we did this in your name and we did this in your name. He said, depart from me. I never knew you. And they were cast in to the lake of fire. But my, what did he do? He, he gave the gift. The, the fact of the matter is, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The word gave there is the word gift. He gave the gift of his only begotten son. You don't pay for a gift. You accept a gift because somebody loves you and they wanted you to have it. For God so loved, put your name there, Judd Riley that he gave the gift of his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, that if Judd Riley would believe in him, Jesus Christ, he would not perish, but have everlasting life. Woo! You're looking at a born-again Christian, my friend. 
Many, many, many years ago, I put my faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, and God gave me the gift of eternal life. I don't know why I always picture that as a big box with green bow and green paper. But after all these years, it's sure getting musty and beat up. <laughs> but if you lift the lid off, that's only the box that contains all the parts of the gift. Did you know, and when you know, Olin would have asked this. Did you know inside of your gift of salvation, there are 53 individual gifts that God gave you. So what did Olin fill out on a card the other day? Why don't you teach on the 53? Well, go look them up. How do you think I found them? Go look them up yourself. Man, you, first thing you got was forgiveness. You just start naming them. You've you got God to look at you. God being a pure eye cannot look at you. But you receive Christ, he can look at you. Pick all the things that God has done for you. Why? Because he gave you the gift of eternal life. Quickly, one other verse, Hebrews chapter 9 and verse number 27. And I should just go ahead and quote it. Hebrews 9 and verse number 27 says, that's 8, that won't work. Here it is, okay. Chapter 9, verse 27. For as it is appointed unto man once to die, but after this the judgment. Now, did you get it? You die once, and without Christ you die twice. You end up in hell for eternity. But God so loved the world that he gave. Look at it in the next verse. Uh, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. And unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. That appearance, that looking to him, that happens the moment you trust Jesus as your Savior. That day, December 11, 19, a long time ago, I called on the name of the Lord. My praying didn't save me. Nobody ever got saved because they prayed. They got saved praying because they needed to be saved. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You say, wait a minute, preacher. That just said you get saved praying. You didn't, there's no period there. But how shall they call on him in whom they've not believed? You believe in your heart and you call with your mouth and salvation becomes the free gift of God for you and for anyone that you want to tell about the Lord Jesus. Notice number five with me, please. His only begotten son, the greatest sacrifice. Can you think of this? I'm going to turn over to Isaiah 53. While I'm turning there, I'll quote one verse out of it that isn't in the group I want. Isaiah 53, 10 says, It pleased the Lord to bruise him. Can you imagine that? He gave his only begotten son the greatest sacrifice. Pictured in Abraham when he took Isaac up on the mountain. Isaac's carrying the wood. His father's got the, uh, the fire and his father's got the knife to serve as out of the fire. And uh, Isaac says, Dad, there's the wood. There's the fire. And he didn't mention the knife, but you've got the knife. Where, where, where's the lamb? About that time, Abraham tied him up, put him on the sacrifice altar, and picked up the knife. God told Abraham, I want your son, your only son, offer him for sacrifice. God knew, God knew what Abraham knew. Abraham knew that God had a son, and that God would provide a son for that sacrifice. But fulfilling what the Lord said, he raised the knife. And just that quick, God stopped him. He said, I see your faith, that you're trusting me for this. About that time, a lamb showed up, a ram showed up in the thicket. He grabbed his son untied and took him out of the way, and he picked up the lamb and put it there, slew it, and offered it as sacrifice. God said, you just pictured for people that hear a sermon how my salvation works. You see, the Old Testament, they offered lambs to cover their sin. But one day, John the Baptist, baptizing in the Jordan River, stopped baptizing. He looked up. I always point my finger. He said, Behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the whole world. And he was pointing at the Lamb of God. Look at the goosebumps. Jesus Christ. The next morning, he was back to going back to the river again. And he looked up and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the whole world. Anytime God says something twice, it's imperative. God gave, so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Here it is, the sacrifice 
the greatest sacrifice of the greatest gift that man could see. I'll use one more verse, Leviticus 17, 11. Leviticus 17, 11, I can't even get it started. Uh, God, all right, I don't have to go there. Leviticus 17, 11. This happens when you start getting, anyway. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. You're alive because you have blood in your body. Cut your wrist and watch what happens in about three minutes. You, you won't watch what happened. The life of the flesh is in the blood, and God hath given it to you upon the altar for the remission of your sins. The life of the flesh is in the blood, and I gave it to you on the altar. In the Old Testament, it was lambs and rams and, and bulls and goats. They offered that blood to cover their sin. But behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the whole world once and for all. It's Jesus Christ. God's greatest gift you can receive, my friend, is him. And then the, the next thing, his only begotten son, the greatest sacrifice, that's the one I was on, uh, Isaiah 53, 6. Just a couple of things here real quick. Isaiah 53, 6 says this. What a sacrifice. They pleased the Lord to bruise him, verse number 10 said. Uh, 53, I'm in the wrong place, here we go. Uh, 53 and verse number uh, 6. For all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Can you imagine such a thing? The greatest sacrifice, verse 10. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He put him to grief. When thou hast made his soul the offering for sin, he shall see his seed prolong his day and, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Verse number 11. He shall see the travail of the, of the soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquity. Verse 8 is the death of Christ. Verse 9 is the burial of Christ. Verse 10 is the resurrection of Christ. And verse 11 is the result. Many will have their soul cleansed because of the sacrifice that's been given. The, la the sixth one. That whosoever, the greatest invitation. Now I'll try to stay with my notes. I'm right there in Isaiah 50. I like it too well. I like to just run around a little bit. Uh, Isaiah 55, 6 uh, is the one we want to look at. Uh, actually, 55, 1. That whosoever, the greatest invitation. Here's God's invitation. Whosoever may come. Anyone can come and believe. He said, Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the water. Uh, and he that hath no money, come ye, buy and eat. Yea, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. God, Jesus paid it all. Verse 6, seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is here. Verse 7, let the wicked forsake his way. That's all it takes. Man, own up. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Stand in the way. Say, yes, God, that's me, and I can't save myself. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him. And, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Isn't that a precious thought? The great price that Christ paid has with it the greatest invitation that God could possibly have given. Come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Through his son, Jesus Christ. Remember the verse of uh, transposition here. For God made Christ to be sin for us. He knew no sin. That we may be made the righteousness of God, righteousness of God in him. Trading places. We have the righteousness of God because Christ paid the debt of our sin on Calvary. That lady walked up to him and he said, he, she leaned over to touch his feet. He said, don't touch me. I've not yet to be uh, ascended to my father. Go tell the disciples to meet me in Galilee. Well, how much more clear does it need to be? He died to become the high priest, prophet, priest, and king. Resurrected, he's the high priest. You can't touch a high priest. If you do, he's unclean for seven days. He's got to go through a whole ritual. He didn't have seven days. Don't touch me. 
While she went and got the disciples, he walked into heaven with his own blood. I picture it in a bowl, I don't know. He walked into the Holy of Holies, the real one in heaven. He walked into the real mercy seat, the real one in heaven. All the ones on earth have only been shadows of the one in heaven. And the eternal Son of God reached in that bowl and took his own blood. And all it required is that he sprinkle it all over that altar. P Peter said he bore our sin as his own body on the tree. He did, but his blood was the pure sacrifice that was put on the altar. God doesn't look for you when you call upon the name of the Lord. He looks for the blood. And when I see the blood, he said, I'll pass over you. God sees the blood of his own son. Now, Jesus came back to earth. That lady brought a bunch of women with her, and it said they held his feet and kissed him. He didn't mind. He had already done the high priestly work of paying for your sin and for mine. Man, the work's done. All you need to do is believe. It's the greatest uh, sacrifice, the, that whosoever, the greatest invitation. Any little boy, any little girl. In fact, God would rather you came like a child. He said, except you become as a little child, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. You get these burly guys, you know, want to be manly nowadays, tattooed everywhere. And, Boy, I'm going to be, I, when I get upstairs, I'm going to let the old man decide for me whether I, there is no old man in heaven. And you're not going to stand before an old man. You're going to stand before the God of the universe. You're going to stand before the righteous spirit of God when he looks at you. And you're not going to have a choice. If you can't, if he can't see you through the blood of his own son, he's going to say to you, depart from me. I never knew you. And you'll go to hell. And you'll stay in hell for eternity. Well, listen, whether you like it or not, if, even if you do that, God ends up with the absolute glory. The Bible said at the end time, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. So here you are at the white throne judgment. The only place out of there is hell. And before you leave, God said, now get on your knees and say it. Say it. Jesus Christ is the Lord. Now depart from me. This is the time to confess Christ. This is the time when forgiveness comes. You get eternal life. Whew. Why would anybody not want to do that? Look at the seventh one. Should not perish. The greatest deliverance. Oh, you may yet die physically. But to be absent in the body is to be present with the Lord. But our real deliverance is in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse number 10. I'll just use one verse for this that I've taken quite a bit of our time. Every uh, chapter in Thessalonica in chapter 1 ends with the resurrection. Every chapter ends with a verse on the resurrection. And here it is in 110. And we're to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, listen, which delivered us, past tense, from the wrath to come. Well, the one wrath is the tribulation. We don't have to worry about that. We'll be in heaven when that takes place. But the other wrath is the white throne judgment. Revelation 20 and verse 11. All the dead, small and great, stand before God. The only thing that keeps you from being judged there says the books were open, but another little book was open, which is the Lamb's book of life. And all those written in the books of their deeds... Mr. Smart Guy, I'll take my chance and I'll let the old man decide. The books have already decided. And if your sins aren't covered by the blood of the Lamb, you have no choice. You have no opportunity at all. But when you put your faith and trust in Christ, he said he delivers you from the wrath to come. <laughs> to be absent from the... Do you know this, Christian? To be absent in the body is to be present with the Lord. What a contrast that's going to be if the rapture were to come right now. And folks are doing other things when they ought to be worshiping the Lord, forsaking the assembling of themselves together as the manner of some is. We're not to do that. Lastly, and I'll close. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, here it is, but have everlasting life, the greatest promise. I can tell you with assurance today to believe in Jesus Christ 
is the guarantee that you will be in heaven. Your name will be called. And whether it be by death, you'll be taken out of the grave. Or if you're alive, you'll be taken off in rapture. You will hear your name called. And you will stand before the Lord. And that's the greatest promise God could possibly have given you. Oh, let's look at one verse here. 1 Corinthians 2.9. 1 Corinthians 2.9 says this. But as is written, I hath not seen or ear heard, neither is entered into the heart of man the things that the Lord has provided for those that love him. Do you love him today? That went back up there to point number two. He loves you, and now you love him, and we love each other, and here we are down here at the end, and God says, welcome. Come on in to paradise, and you get to go there. Has everlasting life. How long is everlasting? Well, it's best seen in John 10, uh, 26 and 27. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. Listen, number one, I give unto them eternal life. Answer me, how long is eternal? Forever and ever. I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. How long is never? Forever and ever. I often say it's it's ever, it's ever and ever in the other direction. You can't beat it, friend. The minute you receive Christ as Savior, all your sins are taken away. Your life begins afresh in the new way in Him. Listen to me, and it never ends. You change places. To be absent from the body here is to be present with the Lord there. And at the end of the thousand years, the old earth and the old heavens are burnt up, and a new heaven and a new earth appear, and we're there with no recollection of all of this stuff. We're there in the presence of the Lord. And the Bible says, so shall you ever be with the Lord. This is not a one-shot thing, friend. This is your life. When the disciples, John 6, 6, 6, in that awful verse, and many turned and walked away from him and followed him no more. 6, 6, 7 says, Jesus said to the disciples, Will you leave me also? Wouldn't you know it would be Peter, the guy with the biggest mouth, the guy with the most foul-ups, would be the guy with the best answer. Jesus said, will you leave me also? And Peter answered and said, can you say this? Lord, where could we go? For thou dost have the word of life, because you are the word of life. I added that last part. Jesus told the lady, I am the resurrection of life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? When you die physically, you're not dead dead to be absent of the body. You go right up into the presence of the Lord. This is the greatest possible promise. I did say the inverse, but Revelation 21 1 says it this way. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth was passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice say out of heaven, a uh, great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them, and he will be their God. Here it is, the greatest promise. You have the promise that's provided through our Savior Jesus Christ that if you put your faith and trust in him, John 3, 16, you will have eternal life. John Guernsey, this one's for you, my dear brother. Every time I tell this story, John, and get out his Kleenexes. Little girl had a dream. In her dream, she saw Jesus. She said, Jesus, is that you? He said, yes, it is. She said, is it really you? He said, yes, it is. She said, Jesus, can I ask you a personal question? He said, yes, you may. She said, uh, do you love me? Jesus looked at the little girl. He said, yes, I love you. She said, do you really love me? He said, yes, I really love you. She said, how much do you love me? Watch the illustration. He said, this much and bowed down his head and gave up the ghost for God so loved the world 
that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I trust that life yours today, friend, but it's not enough for me to trust that. You have to make sure that you have called upon the name of the Lord, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, but how shall they call on him in whom they've not believed? Do it today. Bow your head today and tell God you know you're a sinner, that you believe he sent Christ, all these precious verse, words of the verse, to die in your place, and you right now want to trust Jesus to be your Savior. God will make it happen. Just like that, your name will be in the Lamb's Book of Life, and I'll meet you in heaven someday. We'll stand together and rejoice that you trusted Christ because of John 3.16. Father, thank you for the message. I'm always thrilled by it. I remember John used to say, I wished I could get saved again. I wished I could get lost so I could get saved again. No, I wouldn't want to risk that, but I am so glad that you gave us eternal life. Father, if there's one person that heard this message is not saved, God, let them put their faith and trust in Christ today. I'll thank you for the marvelous finished work of our Savior when someone gets saved. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand with me, please, and turn to number 272. Just a verse. 272. God spoke to your heart. You'd like to come to an old-fashioned. You'd like to get saved. Just step right down here in the front and wait for me. I'll come down. I'll show you how you can trust Christ. Standing, please, 272. Out of my bondage, sorrow, and night, Jesus, I come. Jesus, I come into thy freedom, gladness, and light. Jesus, I come to thee. Out of my sickness, into thy health, out of my want, and in to thy wealth out of my sin and in to thyself Jesus I come to thee well let me remind you we have service tonight at 545 right here in the auditorium it'd be nice and cool uh, have a good day and come back and join us call somebody up invite them to come let's see if we can up our attendance, I think last week. No, I guess we had the same morning and evening. Uh, come back and join us for tonight. God bless you. Shake hands. You're dismissed.